Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pearson's Learning Makes Us webinar series. Today's session is Active Learning in General Chemistry and is being presented by Dr. Neva Tro. Neva Tro is a professor of chemistry at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, where he has been a faculty member since 1990. He received his PhD in chemistry from Stanford University for work on developing and using opti optical techniques to study the adsorption and desorption of molecules to and from surfaces in ultra-high vacuum. He then went on to the University of California at Berkeley, where he did postdoctoral research on ultra-fast reaction dynamics and solution. Since coming to Westmont, Professor Tro has been awarded grants from the American Chemical Society Petroleum Research Fund, from Research Corporation, and from the National Science Foundation to study the dynamics of various processes occurring in thin ad layer films absorbed on di dielectric surfaces. He has been honored as Westmont's Outstanding Teacher of the Year three times and has also received the college's Outstanding Researcher of the Year Award. And with that, Neva, I'll hand it off to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all uh, for coming, and um, I hope you'll find this presentation helpful, and I look forward to any questions you might have at the end. So um, I titled my presentation, Active Learning in General Chemistry, and this was uh, sparked in part by an um, article that appeared in the Proceedings for the National uh, Academy of Sciences in June 2014. And this study was a meta-study uh, meta of 225 other studies. And what the authors here did is they looked at the effects of active learning uh, in these 225 other studies. And they sort of looked at what the average improvement was. And what you can see over here is that on uh, exams and concept inventories, uh, student scores increased by 0.47 standard deviation. And then even more impressive, uh, students in classes with traditional lecturing compared to active learning were one and a half times more likely to fail. These results were so strong that um, the authors uh, concluded that, that these results raised questions about the co continued use of traditional lecturing as a control and research study and support active learning as a preferred validated teaching practice in regular classrooms. Now, what they did for active learning in these 225 studies varied greatly. Um, it could be things like group problem solving, worksheets, tutorials, et cetera. Um, so what I've done is, I've, uh, is I, in my class, I put together a uh, series of exercises for my students, all of which employ this sort of active learning idea. So let me show you what I've been doing. Um, oh, really quick, this is just showing uh, the percentage of students who fail a class in lecturing compared to active learning. And you can see that in um, active learning, the number of students that failed uh, dropped considerably. OK, so what do I do for active learning? So I have a strategy which I call BDA, uh, before class, during class, and after class. And I have active learning activities for my students uh, for each of these times. So let's look at the four class first. Two kinds of active learning activities that I engage my students in before class. Uh, these are uh, key concept videos, which I will now, which I will show you an example of shortly, and active reading. I assign uh, most of this through uh, Mastering Chemistry, which is Pearson's um, electronic homework system, and this is an example of my calendar. And so my class is a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. So Fridays, I don't assign uh, anything on Mastering Chemistry. But on Monday and Wednesdays, you'll see two assignments here for each Monday and Wednesday. One is a before class assignment, and one is an after class assignment. And basically, the before class assignment is due right at class time, and the after class assignment is due at midnight uh, that same day. So what do these uh, look like? So one of the things I've been assigning quite frequently before class is something which I call uh, key concept videos. And these are videos that I created. Uh, and what they do is they introduce the student to a key concept in that chapter that I will then elaborate on in lecture. Um, 
These videos are interactive in that they stop in the middle and ask the student a question. Because again, the idea of the student being active in the learning process is, is important. And, uh, and then they also have a follow-up question in Mastering Chemistry. So I, I would like for you to be able to, to see these videos. So I'm going to show you one right now. Hello and welcome back. In this video, you'll learn about limiting reactant, theoretical yield, and percent yield. These concepts allow you to predict and quantify the amount of product formed in a chemical reaction. Recall from a previous key concept video on stoichiometry that you can draw an analogy between a chemical equation and a cooking recipe. In that video, we used a recipe that called for one crust plus five ounces tomato sauce plus two cups cheese to make one pizza. This cooking recipe gives you numerical relationships between the amounts of ingredients, much like a balanced chemical equation gives you numerical relationships between the amounts of reactants and products. In this video, we will carry that analogy a bit further. Suppose you look in your kitchen and you find that you have four pizza crusts, 10 cups of cheese, and 15 ounces of tomato sauce available to you. How many pizzas can you make with these ingredients? Well, you can use the relationships from the recipe to see how many pizzas you can make from the ingredients that you have on hand. From the four crusts, you can make four pizzas. From the 10 cups of cheese, you can make five pizzas. And from the 15 ounces of tomato sauce, you can make three pizzas. So, how many pizzas can you make? Well, you can only make three because even though you have more than enough crust and cheese, you only have enough tomato sauce for three pizzas. If this were a chemical reaction, the tomato sauce would be the limiting reactant, the reactant that limits the amount of product that you can make. And three pizzas would be your theoretical yield, the amount of product that can be made in a chemical reaction based on the amount of the limiting reactant. Now, suppose you prepare your three pizzas and put them in the oven to cook. You accidentally put one of the pizzas too close to the bottom burner in the oven, and it burns. Even though your theoretical yield was three pizzas, you actually ended up with only two pizzas. If this were a chemical reaction, your two pizzas would be your actual yield, the amount of product actually formed by a chemical reaction. The percent yield is the percentage of the theoretical yield that was actually produced. In this analogy, the percent yield is equal to two pizzas divided by three pizzas times 100%, which equals 67%. All right, now let's apply these concepts to a chemical reaction. The balance equation for the combustion of methane is this. One methane molecule reacts with two oxygen molecules to produce one CO2 molecule and two H2O molecules. Now, suppose you have five CH4 molecules and eight O2 molecules. What is the limiting reactant and the theoretical yield? Well, just as you can use the pizza recipe to calculate how many pizzas you can make from the amount of ingredients that you have on hand, so too you can use the balanced chemical equation to calculate how many product molecules you can make from the amounts of reactant molecules. Start with 5 CH4 and multiply by the ratio 1 CO2 over 1 CH4, which you get from the balanced chemical equation, and you get 5 CO2. Then for O2, start with 8 O2, multiply by the ratio 1 CO2 over 2 O2, which you also get from the balanced chemical equation, and you get 4 CO2. So you have enough CH4 to make 5 CO2 molecules and enough O2 to make 4 CO2 molecules. The limiting reactant is the reactant that makes the least amount of product. Since O2 makes the least amount of product, it is the limiting reactant. The theoretical yield is the amount of product that can be made from the limiting reactant. In this case, the theoretical yield is four CO2 molecules. Here's a practice question for you to try. A reaction mixture for the combustion of octane contains five moles of octane and 50 moles of O2. The balance equation for the combustion of octane is 2 octane plus 25 O2 forms 16 CO2 and 18 H2O. What is the theoretical yield of water produced by this reaction? A, 36 moles H2O, B, 45 moles of H2O, or C, 50 moles of H2O? The correct answer is A, 36 moles H2O. To get this answer, First, determine the amount of H2O that you can make from each of the given amounts of reactants. From the 5 moles of octane, you can make 45 moles of H2O, and from the 50 moles of oxygen, you can make only 36 moles of H2O. 
Therefore, O2 is a limiting reactant, and 36 moles of H2O is the theoretical yield. Okay. Hopefully uh, you were able to watch that and listen to it. And um, when you assign these in Mastering Chemistry, so you, as you saw, you have this interactive question in the middle where the video stops and it asks the student a question. And then Mastering also does a follow-up question uh, where the student has to answer that, and that could be uh, for credit. So that's the way I kind of get my students uh, to do these. These count for um, part of their homework grade. The other uh, thing I do for the four class activities is active reading. And so again, the idea is I don't want the student to just passively read the textbook, but rather interact and answer questions. So these kinds of conceptual connections are scattered uh, throughout the chapters in the book. And um, they force a student to stop and, and answer a question. So for example, this is one that's related also to limiting reactant and theoretical yield. So if you have this reaction, right, and if a flask contains these amounts of nitrogen and hydrogen, uh, what is the limiting reactant, what's an excess, right, and what will the flask look like after the reaction has gone uh, to completion. Um, other active uh, reading types of questions, again, you'll see they'll be after some, sometimes there'll be examples and there'll be a uh, conceptual connection, again, that's active reading. These are also assignable in mastering if you would like to do it that way. Um, here's a section on Coulomb's law, right? And then a question that asks about Coulomb's law. All right, so that's before class. So the students come to class uh, having, having thought about the material already that we're going to be discussing. And then during class, the, the ability to form a little bit of the content to these videos before class allows me some time in class to ask questions of them. And so um, two kinds of activities that I use in class, one of them involves uh, learning catalytics. Learning catalytics is a non-device specific um, personal response system where I can ask questions to students during class and then also some questions for group work, which I'll show you here in a minute. So this is an example screen uh, for learning catalytics. Uh, this is my class. Uh, there are different modules for different class times. I'm going to exit out of this and uh, show you the module that would go along with the um, video you just saw. So let's see here. Give that a second. All right. So. These would be um, the questions that I would pose to my students during class. Um, so for example, here is a uh, chemical reaction, right? How many moles are produced when three moles of CH4 react in excess oxygen? And these questions I scatter throughout my presentation in the lecture. Um, here's the second question. This one, again, basic stoichiometry. The overall equation in photosynthesis is this. How many grams of carbon dioxide are required to produce a certain amount of glucose? Okay. And the answer is 26.4. The nice thing about learning catalytics is that you have a number of answer formats that you can use. You can use multiple choice like you just saw. You can use numerical answers. You can also use graphing and other modes as well. Here's the other question I would ask in that class. Um, a reaction occurs between substance A, the red circles, and substance B, the blue squares, according to this reaction. Identify the limited and excess reagent. And this one is uh, multiple choice. Okay, back here to my presentation. Uh, let's see. Um, Learning Catalytics, by the way, has a nice app that you can use on your phone, so you don't even have to interrupt your normal presentation on PowerPoint. I actually uh, use it on my phone, and I encourage my students to use their smartphones uh, to answer their questions, but they can use their computers or any other smart device as well. Just a couple of other um, question formats. This is one question where a student can just click 
on an area on the screen. So for example, in this case, it says click in the region that corresponds to cations that are two plus. And uh, if the students click in this area, uh, they are correct. If they click anywhere else, they are not correct. Um, questions for group work uh, are questions that I can pose to my students in class and have them work together in groups. So for example, this is one where we're talking about, um, again, um, stoichiometry, living reactant. Uh, so these are some questions that you can use. Uh, in the class for the students to, to work through and do some peer-to-peer -peer instruction. Uh, just a couple other active classroom ideas. Uh, demonstration predictions. Um, I used to just do demonstrations. Now when I do the demonstrations, I ask the students to try to predict the outcome. This makes it kind of fun because students now have some skin in the game. And um, it also helps them to think about the chemistry that's going on. Other ideas uh, for active classroom questions are instead of just working an example passively uh, and showing them the answer, sometimes I'll work an example, let's say like this one, and I'll start to work it out and then I'll stop and then I'll pose the student a question. So for example, here um, we are determined, we're saying that a, a plant c consumes a certain amount of CO2 and the question is how much glucose can the plant synthesize? So here's the solution. I'll start it for them and I'll ask, okay, what's the form? What should be the next conversion factor that goes here? And then I can ask them that question and then I can continue the calculation. Um, also, uh, on some learning catalytic questions, if I see that the students are not getting the answer, I will oftentimes give them some, uh, some extra time, either rephrase the question, or sorry, repose the question, or just give them extra time to discuss it with one another. Um, usually what happens if, when I do this is that it may go from, let's say, 50% of the students getting the right answer to about 80 or 90%. Why? Because the students are talking to each other and helping each other uh, to learn the material. OK, what about after class? So after class, I have two different kinds of activities that I engage my students in. Uh, one is uh, these interactive work examples, which I'll show you an example of here in just a minute, and then also some self-assessment quizzes. So here's uh, an interactive work example. These are similar to the key concept videos that you just saw, but these are actually work examples, and uh, they're also interactive because they stop in the middle and ask the student a question. In this example, you'll learn how to find the limiting reactant for a reaction and calculate the theoretical yield. The problem reads, ammonia, NH3, can be synthesized by the reaction 2NO gas plus 5H2 gas forms 2NH3 gas plus 2H2O gas. Starting with 86.3 grams of NO and 25.6 grams of hydrogen, find the theoretical yield of ammonia in grams. Begin by sorting the information in the problem. You are given that you have a chemical reaction in which you start out with 86.3 grams of NO and 25.6 grams of hydrogen. You are also given the balanced chemical equation. You are asked to find the theoretical yield of ammonia. Next, strategize. Draw up a conceptual plan. The idea here is to determine how much of the product you can make from each of the two reactants. In other words, how much ammonia can you make from the 86.3 grams of NO assuming that there's more than enough H2, and how much ammonia can you make from the 25.6 grams of H2, assuming that there's more than enough NO. Whichever one of these makes the least amount of ammonia is a limiting reactant. Okay, so start with grams of NO, use the molar mass of NO to get to moles of NO, and then use the ratio of stoichiometric coefficients from the balanced chemical equation, that is, two moles of ammonia over two moles of NO, to get to moles of ammonia. Do the same thing with grams of hydrogen. Begin with the grams of hydrogen, use the molar mass of hydrogen to get to moles of hydrogen, and then use the stoichiometric coefficients from the balance equation to get to moles of ammonia. Whichever one of these two results in the smallest number determines the limiting reactant. You would next take that smaller number and then convert from moles of ammonia to grams of ammonia. Notice that, like other stoichiometry problems, this problem is a mass to moles to moles to mass kind of conversion. Okay, 
Now you're ready to solve the problem. Begin with 86.3 grams of NO, multiply by one mole of NO over 30.01 grams of NO. Grams of NO cancel and you're left with moles of NO. Then multiply by two moles of ammonia divided by two moles of NO. This conversion factor comes from the balanced chemical equation. Moles of NO cancel and you get 2.8757 moles of ammonia. Mark that to three significant digits. Next, take your 25.6 grams of hydrogen, multiply by one mole of hydrogen over 2.02 grams of hydrogen. Grams of hydrogen cancel and you're left with moles of hydrogen. Next, multiply by two moles of ammonia over five moles of hydrogen. This ratio again comes from the balanced chemical equation. Moles of hydrogen cancel and you get 5.0693 moles of ammonia. Again, mark this to three significant digits. Now, let's stop and ask this question. What is the limiting reactant? Is it A, and O, or B, hydrogen? The correct answer is A, and O. Since NO gives you the smallest amount of product, then NO is a limiting reactant. Take the amount of ammonia that you can form from the NO, which is 2.8757 moles, and then use the molar mass of ammonia to get to grams of ammonia. So 2.8757 moles of ammonia times 17.03 grams of ammonia per mole of ammonia is equal to 49.0 grams of ammonia, which is the answer. Finally, check. First of all, the units of the answer, grams of ammonia, are correct. Secondly, the magnitude again seems reasonable because the mass, 49 grams, is similar in magnitude to the mass of the reactants it reacted. Okay, so that's, um, that gives the student now the opportunity to really apply uh, what they've just learned, both uh, before class and during class. And um, again, in Learning Catalytics, not only do they interact uh, during the video itself, like you saw, there's also a follow-up problem that they then have to do on their own, right? What is the theoretical yield of ammonia in kilograms that can be synthesized from a certain amount of hydrogen and a certain amount of nitrogen? Uh, the other after-class activity uh, that I use is um, the self, uh, I'm calling the self-assessment quiz. And I use this both after class and also uh, before exam. And uh, what, uh, again, what has been shown uh, in chemical education research is a little article from uh, Journal of Chemical Education. And in this study, the authors gave students pre-test on the material before the actual test. So they were trying to use testing as a method not just of assessment but also uh, of learning. And they used two kinds of tests, pre-tests that they gave the students. One was uh, multiple choice and one was uh, sort of free response or open answer. And uh, the results were very interesting. Um, let me show you them here. So here's the control group. So here's how they did on the exam. Um, they divided their students up into low comprehension students, those students that uh, were not doing very well in the class, and high comprehension students, those students that were doing well in the class. And uh, when they weren't given a pre-exam, here were their scores. When they're giving uh, an open-ended pre-exam that had uh, answers that they call elaborate interrogation, basically just open-ended answers, you could see that um, that the effect of that pre-exam was very minimal. It was really none to speak of in terms of the um, error bars here. But when they were given a multiple choice pre-exam, the students did better uh, than the control group. And interestingly, um, the high comprehension students did better. Uh, the low comprehension students did better. But the effect was greater for those low comprehension students. So a multiple choice pre-exam uh, for low comprehension students really seems to help them do better uh, on the exam. Why multiple choice? Uh, the authors weren't completely sure, but they thought that one reason was because when they gave them these multiple choice uh, pre-exams, the multiple choice questions were scored instantaneously and automatically, and therefore the students knew immediately whether they got the answer right or wrong. And of course, for the elaborate interrogation questions, they did not have that kind of feedback. So um, 
Every chapter uh, in, in my book has a uh, self-assessment quiz. And these self-assessment quizzes can be used either on a daily basis after you cover those materials in class, or it could be used as a pre-exam. Again, this can be uh, assigned in Mastering Chemistry. And when you assign a Mastering Chemistry, some of the questions um, have variable quantities so that the students see the different question every time. And uh, those are, that's the extent of my after-class activities. Um, these are uh, my general chemistry book, uh, all of which have this material ready for you to use if you're interested. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for attending and for listening to me. Uh, it's a, this is the first time I've actually given a webinar, so it's a little strange to be talking without any feedback whatsoever. But I'm happy to uh, take any questions or any comments. Um, I'm happy to have you email me if you have any further questions, too. My email address is tro at westmont.edu. And uh, again, thank you for coming. Great. Thanks so much, Neva. So we do have some questions that have come in, and we have time for some Q&A. So again, if you want to submit your question, just type your question into that questions panel, and we will go ahead and answer it. So we have a couple questions here from Anita at Ball State University. And Anita asks, can you assign points to active learning assignments? Absolutely, yes. So in, uh, in, uh, I assign points to all of these. Um, in, in Mastering Chemistry, the, the, the pre-lecture material um, is, is uh, the video itself. Watching the video doesn't get points, but answering the question afterwards does. And um, so you can assign points that way. The in-class material with Learning Catalytics is all for points. And the way I do it um, is I, for the Mastering Chemistry material, that's about 10% of their grade. Uh, for the in-class Learning Catalytics material, that's about 5% of their grade. For the in-class material, I give um, basically 50% credit for answering and then an additional 50% credit for answering it right. So I value both participation and getting the right answer. And absolutely, this all counts as part of their grade because as most of us know, if it's not part of the grade, the students won't do it. So, um, so yes. Great. So we do have some questions coming in. I'm just sorting through them here. And we have another one from Amanda. In learning catalytics, when students do not do well on the first attempt, do you use LC to group the students for the second attempt? I, I do. I have used that, and it's, it's been successful. I've also sometimes I just let them group themselves. The nice thing about letting learning catalytics group them is it'll tend to group a, um, a student that got it right with a student that got it wrong. So I've noticed that the results can sometimes be better when you do that. Sometimes there's some logistical problems with that in terms of the way the students are sitting. But as long as you, you're using learning catalytics to its full potential and you have students check into their seat, then that works very well. Great. So we have another question here from Sylvester who asks, can your technique be used with other textbooks? Absolutely not. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, yes, yes. It can be used with it can be used with other textbooks. Um, the only with, with with my books, I've, I've I've actually tried to to give you these tools um, so professors can in, uh, incorporate active learning in the classroom. So one of my goals in the last you know two or three years is just to provide a set of tools to allow this kind of learning. I'm pretty convinced that this kind of learning makes a big difference. I've seen it in my own students, and I want to provide the tools uh, for others to be able to do that. So I've actually developed um, these interactive work examples and these key concept videos. We now have a library of about 160 of these. And so um, most of the key topics now, there's a key concept video on. Most of the important types of examples, there's an interactive work example on. And so these are available for you to use. Great. So we have a question here from Sandy at Loyola University, Chicago. What if, what, if any, percentage of your in-class time do you spend lecturing versus employing active learning techniques? So I haven't given up uh, on the lecture. I still, uh, I still, maybe it's just because I like to lecture, um, but I think the key is to not lecture for more than 10 or 15 minutes at a time. So Studies have shown that, it, that attention spans really start to fall off at about 10 minutes. 
And so if, but if you have an activity, like even stopping them and asking them a question, or putting them together in groups and having them work on a problem, anything that you can do resets that attention span. And so then you get another 10 minutes. So the way I've done it in my class is I sort of lecture for 10 or 15 minutes, have a question or activity, and lecture for another 10 or 15 minutes, and so on. Okay, great, thank you. So this one's along the same lines, and I think you might have just answered it, but Kirsten asked, do you find you have enough time during class to do some type of active learning technique for every topic? Do you mix in some basic lecture for some topics? Yeah, basically the same answer. The nice thing about um, the key concept videos is it allows me to put a little bit of content outside of the class, and that buys me a little bit of time in class uh, for active learning activities. Great. So we have Amy at University of Iowa, and Amy asks, what is the typical class size that you have implemented these techniques? My class is about 50 students in general chemistry. I've done it in, uh, I've done it in smaller classes, uh, but, but my class the last couple of years has been right around 50. Great. And let's see, Donald asks, how many chapters do you cover in Gen Chem 1? Do you get to phases of matter? I do not. Uh, I get through chemical bonding. Okay, thank you. So we do have some more questions here, just sorting through them. They're coming in fast and furious, so that's great. Thanks for all the questions, everybody. So let's Yeah, thank see. you. These are good. Um, Amanda asks, would you provide some more examples of the demonstrations, activities you have used with learning catalytics in your class? I'm always looking for new demos to use. Um, yeah, if you uh, send me an email, I, 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 it'd be easier for me to do that offline. So tro at westmont.edu, T-R-O at westmont.edu. Perfect. And if you have any of my books laying around in your office, my email is in the preference, too. Great. Thank you so much. So those are all the questions that have come in. Do you have any last words for us, Neva, before I close it out? No. Uh, just uh, thank you all for attending, and um, I appreciate the interest, and best of luck to you in uh, Gen Chem. And I'd like to thank you for a great presentation, and thanks to everyone for attending today. On Friday of this week, we are devoting an entire day to the topic of career development. If you're interested in any of the four sessions you see there on the screen, you can still sign up via the same website you use to register for this session. And we will have a survey that comes up here in a moment once I close out the, web the webinar. So please go ahead and complete the survey. We do appreciate any and all feedback that you provide us. And with that, I would just like to say thank you so much for joining today and have a great day.